Hello, everybody. My name is John Lustry. I'm the Education Coordinator uh, with the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, and I'm thrilled uh, to be joined today by Dr. Amy Merle Taylor. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. And we're going to be talking about her excellent book, Embattled Freedom, which we do sell at the in our museum bookstore. We're, of course, not open at the moment, um, but if you enjoy what you hear here, um, you can email us at store at civilwarmed.org, and uh, you can purchase the book through the museum. It's a, a great way to help support the museum. Uh, and for all of you new members out there, you get special discounts uh, on the book. So this would be a great way to take advantage of that, even if you can't come to the museum at this time. So uh, I'll, I'll remind you of that at the end, once you're uh, newly inspired by what an excellent book this is uh, and how interesting uh, Dr. Taylor's comments are, are going to be here. So um, thank you again for tuning in. Uh, please like the video if you like it, or at least if you, if you think you're going to like it, um, share it. Uh, so that your, your friends can see it, or, or even better, uh, send it to someone specifically that you're certain might enjoy it. Um, yeah, all that really helps us out, um, gets more people to, to see the content we're producing. Uh, and if you want to go take that even a step further, uh, consider maybe becoming a member. Uh, we've been just so thrilled by all of you who tune in regularly to these. A number of you have, have become members and you're supporting our mission um, during this time where our doors are closed. Um, thank you so much for that. And if you've been on the fence uh, until today, maybe now is the day that you decide to become a, a member. Um, we'd really appreciate it. You can become a member for as low as $25 a year. That's, uh, I don't know, a couple different, that's a subscription to Netflix and Hulu, um, but for the whole year. Um, so anyway, uh, that'd be wonderful if you could do that. If you're not at a point where you can do that, maybe even a small donation, five, ten dollars um, would really help us out quite a bit. Uh, and if you're not at a place where you can do any of that, like I said, you can like the video and share the video and all that makes such a, such a big difference for us. So with all that said, let's go ahead and, uh, and get started. Um, so, Amy, maybe tell us uh, a bit about yourself and your inspiration for this project. Uh, where, where did the ideas come from here? Well, I am a historian of the Civil War era and Reconstruction, and I have been researching and writing for over 20 years now. And where this book came from is over time, I've always been interested in photographs of the Civil War. Um, as we know, there are some amazing photographs from Matthew Brady's studio, Alexander Gardner, and so forth. And there's some photos out there that maybe some people listening have seen of groups of African American people. Uh, one in particular, there is um, a big wagon, and it's a group of people. Some are sort of standing around it, some are sitting. Men are in uniform or partial uniform, and it's this image that has always struck me and it was one that I could not figure out what the story of it was. I couldn't figure out who the people were exactly, why were they there, where were they going, what were they doing. And I realized that in all the, with all the history books I had read about the Civil War, there wasn't enough there to allow me to tell the story of this picture. So there was something going on with the movement and migration of African-American people that um, I needed to dig into, I realized, in order to, to understand the story. So my book, you could say, is like the story of that photograph. <laughs> um, it's the story of the mass migration of enslaved people out of slavery and behind the lines of the Union Army seeking refuge during the war. And um, I hope it'll help more people to understand those kind of image, images, but also to understand what I think is a really crucial part of the Civil War story that's only barely been told. I, I love that. I love that you can point so specifically to that, that one individual photograph. And I, I know exactly the one you're talking about. It's, I, it's I, a, good, I, I was just thinking I should have brought it with me. If I was more savvy, I'd share my screen or something, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, well, well, when I ask you this next question, I'll, I'll look for it because I think I can find it fairly easily and I'll see if I can get it and uh, so we can screen share it here. Um, so I'll, I'll work on that. Um, 
I, I love asking uh, authors this because I think sometimes there's some really interesting answers. Um, talk a little bit about, about the full title um, for the book and why exactly uh, you chose it. Uh, so the full title is Embattled Freedom, Journeys Through the Civil War's Slave Refugee Camps. Well, I'll start with the subtitle actually, Journeys uh, Through These Slave Refugee Camps. And one of the things I'm trying to do in the book is really capture the day-to-day -day experience of being somebody who is in slavery one day and then the next is seeking freedom in this thoroughly militarized, war-riven con uh, context. Um, so I really, I follow people from the very beginning of the war into the post-war period as they move in and out of these camps. So that's what the subtitle is really trying to sort of capture that kind of movement. Um, the first part though, embattled freedom is really emphasizing that any kind of freedom that they find and encounter in a time of war is going to be one that is limited, one that is easily endangered, one that is under siege, certainly by uh, the enemy, but sometimes by the Union Army itself. Uh, it's what I call an embattled freedom. Um, also, a, a term that really captures something I want to emphasize is just how this is all happening in the midst of a war. I think um, the sort of the military experience of people becoming free is not something that we fully understood and uh, something I really wanted to emphasize. Did you find the picture? Uh, I think I just did. Um, <laughs> let me get this um, ready here. Okay, and you can uh, confirm with me that this is indeed the one you're talking about. Okay, screen share. Okay. Uh, is this the one? Yes, that's absolutely it. And, um, you know, maybe somebody seeing this for the first time will sort of react the same way I did the first time, which is, wow, there's a lot going on here. And, yeah, you know, no kidding. There's children in there, uh, in that wagon, and um, you know, there's just a lot of questions that that this picture raises. But it's from Virginia. It's from one of the regions that I do talk about in my book. Uh, any idea on uh, uh, the year on this photo? I did know. Um, <laughs> and, um, I believe it's 63, 64, but um, I can't remember exactly right sure. off. Mm -hmm. Got it. But yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly a, a really incredible image. I mean, it raises, just like you said, all kinds of questions. Who are these people? Um, where are they going? You know, why are they dressed the way they are? And you know, who are the people, the, these military figures in the background there? It's, and, and it's so rich. The, the question that I also wanted to know, which then became a central question of my book, is how were they living? Mm -hmm. I mean, where, where were they sleeping? Where was their shelter? Where was food coming from? And you mentioned clothing, um, you know, these essential elements of living and surviving. How, how did they, you know, obtain these things and uh, in a time of war? So that, those kind of ideas uh, make me uh, curious about this question. So you're, you know, as I hope most people know, uh, watching this, you know, basically any any history book doesn't occur, you know, in a vacuum. I mean, everyone's inspired by something, um, or you know, other authors, or in some cases, directly responding to other authors. And mm -hmm. and uh, this book, I think, is part of uh, an emerging wave of scholarship about this very subject, uh, and two that just pop into my mind. Um, Jim Downs' book, Sick from Freedom, who we've had on here, and uh, Chandra Manning uh, writing Troubled Refuge, who we've also had on here. And so I'm curious, and, and there are others besides that, of course, and I'm curious um, where you envisioned embattled freedom fitting into that, that kind of world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you say it's a wave, I'd almost say it's a tidal wave. Of <laughs> sure. Happening, and I'm really glad. It's, it, it's really, it's an honor and, uh, to be a part of it. Um, you know, this is a, a trend in historical study that is looking at how exactly slavery broke down during the Civil War, which as you know, um, you know, that's not something we've ignored for a long time, but oftentimes that story was a very Lincoln-centered story. 
Uh, it was the story of his proclamation, which led people to believe that once the proclamation came down, people were free. And that was the story of how uh, slavery was abolished. Well, that story is um, too simple, too neat, and erases the work of African-American people themselves who arguably pushed Lincoln, uh, pushed his hand, and uh, were the ones that made sure this war was about ending slavery. So, um, so I'm joining the historians you mentioned, uh, Jim Downs and Chandra Manning, their excellent books, as well as uh, Joseph Reedy has a new book called Illusions of Emancipation, uh, Thavolia Glimpf, and uh, her new book about women. And, uh, you know, these books are really teasing out the process by which so how somebody became free you know the day-to-dayness of it all and um, do it in different ways uh, Jim Downs book is an excellent view of the health crisis that uh, anybody trying to free themselves encountered during this war um, Chandra Manning looks at questions of citizenship and how what happens during the war would uh, pave the way but also reveal the complicated road ahead uh, to obtaining citizenship um, in the United States and um, I'm looking at a couple things I guess are a little bit distinguished um, I was really interested in something I mentioned before, how did simply they live in these camps sure. and survive? Um, and I particularly looked at the physical experience, looking at shelter, looking at food, looking at clothing, um, looking at the material dimensions of living in a refugee camp. And I argued that this, you know, something as simple as trying to find an article of clothing was elemental to the process of becoming free. It was not all about high policy and politics. Um, but also my book, one of the things I was trying to do was sort of get past the bird's eye view of what happened and really look at it from the perspective of individual people. And so there are certain people who really drive my book story. Um, and I really try to help the reader get down literally on the ground and uh, follow what it was like for one person to move step by step uh, forward and sometimes back again um, over the course of the war. Mm -hmm. there, there's so much I love about all that. Um, first thing, you know, just that, you know, the, these incredible moments throughout history, um, like emancipation, but of course there are other examples throughout mm -hmm throughout human history that, that are incredible. But uh, oftentimes I think people, especially when they learn about it for the first time, you know, at the end it gets tied up with a little bow. Okay, emancipation happened. Great, we can move on to the next the next thing. And certainly as, you know, the protesting that's going on now demonstrates that, you know, these things definitely don't get tied up with little bows. And so I think looking yeah. at that kind of day-to-day -day reality on the ground is such a, an important way to mm -hmm. study this, even if it's kind of frustrating for, I guess, the way that humans process information, because we want a sweeping narrative, we want the broad brush strokes, we want the quick information download and all that stuff. And I get it. Um, but it, it's just, it's so hard to really kind of wrap your mind around it unless you look at these kind of specific instances. So that, well, that is great. Well, I was gonna say one thing, I agree with you. And one thing that I think readers sometimes of history are sometimes, and I see this with my students in class, are very tempted sometimes to sort of see the past as kind of this inevitable progression. Mm. You know, that of course the Civil War was going to end with the end of slavery. Um, it just, you know, it was time, <laughs> you know, um, and that, that, that sense of inevitability is very powerful. But of course, the thing that we historians push back against is what we see are the, the contingencies on the ground, those moments when things could have gone another way. And we look at kind of, well, then what made it go the way that it did? And as you say, um, you know, the work of African-American people during this war um, you know, if we look and see just even every small step that they took, we see some of those contingent moments that pushed forward and made sure uh, that the war ended with slavery. And so, yeah, talk about resonant with today. Um, you know, what happened during the Civil War is a perfect example of the power and the need for mass protest. And uh, I mean, you could argue 
that this migration, which maybe I should mention for those who are unfamiliar, that we're talking about over 500,000 people. This is about one eighth of the enslaved population. Um, you know, there's a historian, Stephen Hahn, who has asked the question, was this the greatest slave rebellion in history? You know, so we can think of it as a rebellion, we can think of it as a mass protest. Um, what we do know is that collectively, the power of those numbers were really, uh, was very strong and very decisive. So um, interesting, I mean, so many resonances with today, but that would be one of them. Mm -hmm. And thank you for citing that number. That's, uh, that's mm -hmm. an incredible one and one that uh, everyone should know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you made a, a great point earlier about, um, you know, of course, getting down to individual stories. And part of why this is so important to do, I think, is because specifically with the experience of these these refugee camps, how local the situation really was. I mean, I, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the conditions could vary quite widely from uh, camp to camp and perhaps even within each camp. And, and that's where I'm going with this question is, give us maybe an idea with, of course, the understanding that it's a little bit different everywhere, but talk yeah. about some of these conditions. How good were they? How bad were they? What was it like? Oh boy, that is a big question. <laughs> yeah, it's, and take that wherever you wanna go with that. We'll start, I'll just tell anybody listening that um, if you imagine a refugee camp today, you're not that far off of what some of them looked like um, back in the Civil War period. So maybe that Im immediately can transport somebody uh, mentally. But um, yes, so these camps varied a great deal and largely because this was not a coordinated effort in any way. So this was not something that the Union Army set out to encourage. In fact, they set out to discourage it um, at the very beginning of the war. So this is not something coordinated from above and not really coordinated from below because uh, the movement of African-American people, a lot of this was very sort of last minute and spontaneous. You know, they weren't following a blueprint necessarily either. Um, so as a result, that's one of the reasons why the camps themselves uh, would look very different from place to place. Um, and I guess I should note, I've counted over 300 of these camps, but I think that's a conservative number. So um, some were in existence only for a few days, some were in existence for nearly four years of the war. Uh, they were along the coast in you know, coastal communities, South Carolina Sea Islands, uh, coast of Virginia, but then in the Mississippi River, along the Mississippi River in cities like Memphis, in Vicksburg, but also in the islands in the Mississippi River. And then they were spread out, particularly Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and plantations. Former plantations became the sites of refugee camps. So, so the variance also is an environmental one um, that you know, where these took root could determine you know, the availability of work or what sort of work could be done, but also uh, that you know, certainly had effect on the health um, and exposure to illness and disease. Um, but then also what would vary from place to place uh, depended on how close one of these camps was to active combat. Mm. So uh, anything that was close to a, a, a nearby campaign um, was very vulnerable. And oftentimes these were the camps that would have to be evacuated very quickly. And so we're very uh, short-lived. Um, places though where they were removed from active combat for most of the war, what happens there is they start following kind of a life cycle where maybe originally they were simply a collection of tents, oftentimes like old cast off tents from the Union Army. So holes and tears and you know these were not great tents, no floors, nothing. Um, but Removed from combat, there was the opportunity to, over time, build more permanent housing and build what eventually became something more like a village. Hmm. So one example is on the property of Robert E. Lee, Arlington, uh, became the site of a place known as Freedman's Village, which um, if, you know, there are illustrations and photos of that as well, but there are, um, you know, there was housing built you know, according to the same design at very regular intervals on streets with schools and churches and, you know, really became something like the beginning of uh, a town. 
But um, so those were in various places too. But, you know, and some of those, you look at the pictures, you think, huh, you know, they were developing a pretty stable, um, permanent existence. But then if we had some of the pictures of camps on an island in the Mississippi River, you would have seen utter devastation. You would have seen flooding. Um, you would have seen eventually the evacuation of people, but also the death of uh, many people. So, you know, as you say, very much a, a varied picture. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll just leave it there for now. Sure. Uh, now, what would, you know, given, of course, that we are a medical museum, uh, what would access to medical care look like? W was there someone that mm -hmm. was charged with overseeing these places, uh, you know, like uh, doctors assigned to these places, or was it basically, if you're sick, good luck, figure it out? Well, yes, or maybe another way to put that is self-care was mm -hmm. um, maybe the predominant form of medical care. Um, you know, as Jim Downs's book describes, somebody entering into these camps could not count on consistent um, or even any medical care from the army. And of course, medical care was inconsistent for soldiers as well, but it was compounded uh, for these refugees and clearly because of race. And here we see another resonance with today, um, clear functioning of um, you know, a long-standing devaluation of Black lives um, in this inadequate medical care. But um, so self-care, so we can't ignore the fact that refugees themselves, though, um, had always in slavery taken care of themselves. Um, women in particular performed functions that we would describe as more like a nurse or a healer, um, and I write about, for example, a woman named Eliza Bogan, who was in the Mississippi Valley, who joined a regiment as a laundress. And she was somebody who had been, she lost one husband to the slave trade, another one to death. Uh, she was following now another husband into war. He was a member of this regiment. And uh, as she's following the regiment as a laundress, she started doing what a lot of laundresses did, which is basically become de facto nurses. Um, and she became the one that when measles uh, had an outbreak um, in this regiment, particularly in this one company, uh, she was the one caring for these men. And uh, there's little glimpses in her records of what she did, what did self-care or what did this kind of informal um, medical care outside the army. What did it look like? Well, uh, she got him and this is um, the soldiers, I should say, but it also included her husband who came down with measles. Um, she got him and a medic to purge himself of the illness, believing that um, that would be one way to rid him of measles. But uh, also she's a long way from home, but she sends another soldier out to some lady who she doesn't name to get niter this topical ointment for the measles, um, which I always found quite interesting. How on earth, when she's in a totally new place, does she learn about local sources of you know, these kinds of medicines and ointments? So there was clearly a uh, communications network that was alive and well, uh, that was informing her of, of how to do this. So, um, so that's self-care. You, know, you also asked about the army itself and the institutionalized kind of medical care. And, you know, um, of course, there were always some officials who were concerned about the health of these refugees and commented on the very high death rates in some of these camps. And um, some were concerned truly about the welfare of these formerly enslaved people. Others were more concerned that perhaps they would become carriers of disease that would then affect soldiers. Um, however, it was there was some growing interest in some places uh, to do more formally for medical care. And one example is in the Mississippi Valley in December 1863, when a, um, a man named D.O. McCord, a surgeon, was appointed the medical director of Freedmen. And he was the first one ever. And his, his jurisdiction was the whole Mississippi Valley. So we're talking uh, from Tennessee down to Louisiana. I mean, a big... Play, big region. Oh my goodness. And he, he takes 
uh, the position in December 1863, and he goes on a tour to get the current state of medical care for refugees. And he finds that there are eight surgeons who are currently assigned to oversee the health of over 100,000 people. And not only that, he, he meets with them and decides that most of them are incompetent, as he puts it. So he's disgusted by this situation. Um, he notices that some of the refugees are going outside the army, not just among themselves, but into local communities and hiring what he calls citizen surgeons, so just local civilians. But the local civilians are gouging them and charging exorbitant rates. And so that's just a bad situation as well. So McCord goes out, he hires uh, 32 more surgeons over the next six months. He uh, gets buildings, this is kind of interesting, sent, manufactured in Chicago and Cincinnati, they're put on boats and they're sent into the South to be hospital buildings, just eight of them. Um, and so he tries to, to expand, um, it's never quite enough, but um, before we celebrate him, I think, you know, it's also important to point out some of his limits, which um, one is that in addition to hiring surgeons, he needed to make sure there were nurses around as well. And he absolutely drew the line against employing black women as nurses, mm. uh, which was not uncommon in um, the union's, you know, medical services. But, um, you know, when you think about somebody like Eliza Bogan, who, you know, it's pretty clear she had some knowledge about healthcare going back to her time in slavery. This was something that she, uh, I mean, had some expertise. She knew what ointment to look for and this and that, um, you know, long been a provider of care and now she's, you know, sort of ignored and shut out of, um, from being a nurse. So that tells you a lot, I think, about um, the situation, even as there's progress and growth, um, you know, you can see the limitations of certainly McCord's white supremacist thinking in terms of who should be a healthcare provider. Mm -hmm. Man, what a what an incredible That's story! A long there. story. <laughs> no, it's it's a it's a good one, uh, and one that I'm I'm guessing a number of our listeners uh, may not have heard before. I mean, that's that's incredible. There's uh, a, a lot of threads to pull at um, yeah. in, in there, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, one final question about the you know, and of course we could talk all the live long day about about this. There's certainly a lot to talk about, but uh, one question about these refugee camps before I move on to a different subject: um, how how were they established? What was it um, just that a number of people uh, of the, these refugees ended up going there and they just decided they were going to stay there, or was there were these kind of formal camps that were opened, or how, how did that process? Yeah. Work? Now, it always started with the actions of uh, people refugeeing themselves mm. and showing up in a camp. So never, I mean, I can't think of one example of a union encampment that's, you know, put out a sign that said, hey, refugees, welcome, we're ready for you. No, it wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> like that at all. Um, it was groups of people who would show up. And over time, the union had then making it increasingly clear that the union was open um, to them. But that often was sort of the, the policy on high. And in these local places, it would now fall to a union commander to actually deal with sort of the, the nuts and bolts of like space, um, you know, food rations, this and that. How would this work? So what that meant is they would show up but then oftentimes it was a very fraught process of actually establishing their shelter and their housing, finding a space, working with the local command, um, you know, and making this work. So that's a big part of the story, especially I have some chapters about shelter because that was really kind of the first step of establishing a camp. I mean, that's the first, one of the first things you need besides mm -hmm. food um, is shelter and, um, so that was often something that refugees themselves in a very ad hoc manner started to create. But then depending on who the local command was, they might get more and more help from the army along the way. But that would be how it would start. I love that. And that lends even further importance to the idea of, uh, of self-care, care from within the community. Um, mm -hmm. Because, and you would have to imagine that 
you know, in heading north or in some cases east or, or whichever direction they're going, um, you know, th they're the only way I would imagine that they would sort of count on the Union Army is just to uh, to to avoid, you know, immediate uh, either recapture or you know, violence and things like that. And beyond that, I would have to imagine that to some degree, they're kind of aware that, you know, they might need to be to rely upon themselves for things like medical care or mm -hmm. whatever. And, and, you know, they'll take what they can get. But well, uh, I think it's important to point out that they had always relied on themselves. That exactly, even exactly. Slavery, their whole existence was not given to them by their own. You know, this is, um, they always built their shelters. They always had supplemented their food rations. Um, they'd always taken care of their health. So in some ways there's some continuity. Um, this wouldn't always come as a particular shock, maybe put it that way, um, to somebody new in a camp. But it is, I guess it is important to point out that um, the Union Army in theory and in policy did commit to providing food rations. Um, to refugees. So that was something that they could count on. Um, and in most places, there were orders about providing shelter as well. But that, I mean, that was a more, as I said, fraught process. Um, so, and then they relied on the army for protection, for physical protection, as you say. But uh, I mean, even there, you know, with this history, every time we try to make a generalization and say, this is what the army did, or this is what, you know, refugees did, there's like 10 million exceptions. And um, physical protection is, is one of those where maybe that was the duty of the Union Army, but in some places, some individual soldiers and even officers did just the opposite. I mean, there are cases in Kentucky of uh, refugees being sold into the slave trade with the assistance of uh, members of the Union Army. Yeah. So, um, you know, getting back to the subtitle of my book, Journeys, I mean, some of these journeys are, you know, two steps for one step forward, six steps back, or, you know, it, it's a really um, not a straight line to freedom, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, I think the, the words that, that just pop out to me uh, in the midst of this conversation are journeys and embattled. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that be you know it's it's hardly straightforward, mm -hmm. and, and it's uh, n not always peaceful and or easy. Um, right. There's a, a amount of contention that goes mm -hmm. into all of this, which I think is really really important to remember, especially these days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's exactly what pushes back against that. Um, and, and I mean no disrespect to Lincoln. What he did with his mm -hmm. policy and the proclamation was super enormously important. But um, as I said. That's a gives us a very simple sort of triumphant, inevitable kind of story of the coming of freedom, and this really pushes back against that. Well, you know, in some ways, you can't really have one without the other, and I'm just saying that as I'm thinking it now. I'm not a thousand percent prepared to stand by that, but but in some ways, you can't you can't have one without the other. Uh, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation probably doesn't happen if they're not, you know. Uh, 500,000 people fleeing in mass um, and and perhaps vice versa. I, I don't know, it's just something well, I think No, about. it's not even perhaps. I mean, if the union had not begun taking some steps in its policy to encourage and allow this, um, probably would have ended with a pretty different result, even, even more tragedy, but fewer people fleeing as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and you think about uh, whatever change may come as a result of the, the protests happening these days, that would sort of be like saying whatever happens, whatever laws get passed or changes, uh, only sort of celebrating the, the lawmakers and sort of not giving a lot of credit to the people mobilizing and sort of trying to push for this. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, so many moments in our history, huge, enormous moments of social and political change, there is a grassroots force that's been pushing the hand of the policymakers. And, um, you know, I'm not the only historian out there who's, who's made that point and has tried to illustrate that. But I think sometimes in our popular memory, it's easy to kind of forget that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're, you're, you're right to point out we're not exactly uh, breaking new ground here. Um, but, but I think it's, it's important. It. <laughs> right, yeah, it's, it, but it, I think it's important to underscore, um, you know, just in, in very similar ways that, you know, it, it's still 
worth saying that the you know the Civil War was was fought about slavery, um, and it's important to keep saying because you know there's there's still some people out there that you know are not totally on board. So again, it's you know it's not breaking news, but it's still worth saying um, because it's you know it's an important point. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to pivot here a, a little bit, you know, in, in, a, in a book uh, of this nature, it's obviously vitally important to get uh, black voices uh, in the book to tell their own story, which, of course, mm -hmm. in the historical record is can be challenging. Um, mm -hmm. So how did you approach that and what sources did you use? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think most people listening can probably understand that there's not a gold mine archive of the voices of people fleeing slavery during the Civil War. Um, and if people didn't know that, well, why is this? Um, you know, a couple things. You know, this was not a population that was sitting around writing about their experience as it was happening. Um, certainly, circumstances worked against it, but also you know, a, many could not write, um, which is something that would begin to, you know, that would change a little more rapidly during the war. That's a whole other story. But, um, and then, you know, there weren't people around to save and preserve their records carefully, like white families of soldiers would with their uh, letters and diaries. So we don't have this big trove. Um, but I did find, and um, I was tipped off on this thanks to some work at the University of Maryland by the Freedmen and Southern Society Project, which is a documentary editing project where historians have gone into the military records of the Union Army that are at the National Archives and um, begun pulling, and they've pulled just a small percentage of them, but editing and publishing them. And I looked at these volumes and I realized what I didn't know before, which is that the Union Army was extraordinary as a record keeper. Um, clerks were located in all these Union installations. And sometimes, you know, it, I mean, keeping track of, you know, each food ration that was given out and who it was given to, um, who was hired to do what kind of work and what were they paid, um, who was getting arrested for X, Y, and Z. I mean, you know, every single order that was issued was often, you know, written by these clerks in beautiful handwriting. Um, and uh, God, God bless that beautiful handwriting. Oh my God, Thank, <laughs> thankfully. Um, and sometimes in like duplicate or triplicate. And these records are at the National Archives today. So the military records were a, the primary base that I looked at. I also looked at records of some missionaries from the North and reformers who were coming down from the South, the Quakers, members of the American Missionary Association. They showed up in camps um, to try to help and they kept really good records too. But the military records um, I kept going back to and they are limited in how much they give us in terms of the voices of these refugees. Because again, these were kept by the clerks largely um, or some military officials. So it's always filtered through the pen of a white person, any voice. Um, and most of the time, I mean, some of those voices come through in maybe a dictated uh, petition or deposition or something. But oftentimes the records document more about where a person was and what they were doing at a particular moment in time. They document actions of the refugees more than words. Mm -hmm. And I just came to believe that those could be useful too. So a provost marshal record book that has a man who was just arrested for selling whiskey. Um, this is a, a, a black man it, arrested for selling whiskey. You know, that's all it says. It doesn't provide his account. But you can take that and start asking, well, why would he be selling whiskey? Who is he selling to? Why is he selling? Uh, where did he get the whiskey? Why would he choose that? I mean, all sorts of questions that can then get you in with corroborating evidence um, inside the minds of somebody coming out of slavery. And you start to see the importance of uh, making money and you know, supporting themselves financially. So you can read a lot into actions. Um, but this was challenging and, you know, I won't keep rambling on about it, but, um, you know, I think in general, the pursuit of voices is important. And I certainly did look for the voices, but 
even snippets of actions could be telling too. I think that's fascinating. And I think that'll be fascinating to people watching this as well, because, you know, again, people watching this, I think, you know, enjoy reading historical books, you know, like yours. Uh, and, and, but at the same time, and, and they're kind of sort of aware where, you know, this information comes from. But what I think is sort of kind of, and maybe I'm assuming something here, what I think is kind of a mystical thing is the act of the historian going and reading these documents and kind of knowing which questions to ask. It's not obvious. I mean, it's hard enough when you have a beautifully written, very long letter that addresses the exact subject you're, you're trying to get at. I mean, that's, even that's hard. Um, yeah. But but finding something like this, this little nugget, like, you know, this person was arrested selling whiskey, even kind of knowing which questions to ask or even coming up with questions yeah. like that, I think is interesting to people. It's certainly interesting to me as I'm hearing you you say that, because I'm just thinking, I mean, some I might have gotten there, but I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. actually, I think, quite clever. Well, you and you can't know what questions to ask until you've really immersed yourself in the context around you know, these sources. And I have to say, I was fortunate. I spent, um, I had some fellowships and I spent two years on and off at the National Archives, literally wallowing in these records. And I think when you have the luxury of time and resources, and I was very fortunate in that, um, to do that, you really start to like get the context, get the whole scene, and then that helps trigger the questions. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll say a little thank you to the National Endowment for the Humanities that, uh, was a provider of the fellowship money that enabled me to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, that, that certainly helps. Um, was there a, a chapter in the book that, was, uh, did, that you found was particularly easy to write as in it just kind of flowed out of you or one that was perhaps particularly challenging to write that you just labored for days and days and days, weeks and weeks. Um, Cause I think sometimes it's interesting to hear that it's, it's, I think often not the ones that you might expect. Well, I want to meet a writer who has a chapter that flows easily and I'm sure yeah. they're out there, but I'd love to meet them and hear what those circumstances were because that was not my experience at all. Um, this took a very long time to write and I completely reconstructed it on many occasions. So, um, it was challenging. I would say, so I'll, I'll focus on the chat, what made it challenging. And, the, um, there were actually three chapters really challenging to write and they were challenging because they each focused on a particular individual. So I mentioned that I try to follow the experience of individuals like Eliza Bogan providing healthcare. Um, and those were challenging. Um, because, I mean, on the one hand, I felt they were important to illuminate the experience of people who were not previously known in Civil War history, but whose actions were really consequential. Um, it was important to give them the sort of visibility and, um, you know, give them a place in our history. So I felt really, I felt that that was really important. And I felt that by following their experiences, we get that data day ness um, of the struggle to become free. But, you know, the documentation of their lives was scarce. So that made it, for reasons we just talked about, um, that made it challenging to piece together their stories. And, you know, what I was dealing with for each one were just what um, the historian Marisa Fuentes has called archival fragments, mm -hmm. which is often what all we have in the lives of an enslaved or formerly enslaved person, just fragments. Um, and I did feel like other historians, um, that you know you can't dismiss the fragments. You can't say, oh, there's not enough to work with here. Um, it's imperative to work with them and, in order and not dismiss them in order to you know, make our history more truthful and complete and you know, include the people who need to be included. Um, so, so that was just challenging to work with the fragments and piece things together. The other thing that was challenging was um, you know, I had to not fill in the gaps with my imagination. It wasn't that, but, you know, had to do some sort of educated interpreting of the fragments. Um, you know, what, what was likely, what were they likely thinking? What were, why were they probably doing what they were doing? Um, but I felt like as I was doing this, an enormous gulf between myself white woman living in the 21st century. I had an NEH fellowship, as I just mentioned, to go sit in the archives. Like, what a luxury. 
Um, what a gap between my experience and theirs. So how could I ever fully put myself in their shoes and begin to answer some of those questions about what they were thinking and feeling and doing? Um, so I was very aware of that. It made it challenging, but I also still felt an obligation to try. And um, I mean, that's about all I can say is I tried to do my best to, to piece together their stories um, and understand it as best as I could. But with the caveat that I can never fully know exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll end with this question, and it's one that I, I, I like asking authors. Um, now that you know, Embattled Freedom's been out for 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 a little bit now, uh, and you know, it's now going to sort of go on and start having a life of its own. Um, what's your hope for someone that picks up the book? Well, um, what what do you want people to kind of walk away with? I hope that it helps to continue blowing open these neat and tidy and romantic stories we tell about the Civil War. The mythologies, like the lost cause mythologies that are behind these Confederate monuments that are finally coming down. Um, you know, just other sort of neat and tidy stories that we have. I hope that somebody picks up this book and reads, oh, wow, the war was different than what I thought. There's a whole story here that I didn't know. And I hope it kind of helps inject more questions and confusion into people's minds. I mean, that's not really what I guess an author usually says they want to do. They want to clarify things for people. But I hope that it actually helps break things open. And I've gotten some feedback along those lines that it has for some um, people. And um, I, I guess that's my hope, you know, is, is it continues to do so. Mm, uh, I, I love that, and and that's uh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I would I would agree. You're probably the first author I've heard that uh, says, "I hope this really confuses people." <laughs> I put it in those terms before, but I think that's essentially what it comes down to. I mean, sure. I, I want them to have clarity on this particular story, but I want them to have a little more confusion and unsettle some of the things they've been saying about the war more generally. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, absolutely. Uh, complicating the narrative uh, and all that. That's another stuff. way to put it. Yes. <laughs> that's that's great. Um, well, this has been so much fun. Uh, thank you for coming on and uh, and discussing this. Um, thank you to all of you out there. Uh, yes, you uh, tuning in and watching. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this and and been. Uh, stimulated and had a narrative complicated for you. Um, if you like this video, consider liking the video. Um, perhaps even share the video, tell your friends about it. Um, and if, if you're able at this time, consider becoming a member of the museum. It supports programming like this um, that we will continue to do, uh, even when the museum does open back up. For anyone of you out there concerned if, uh, that we might stop doing these sorts of things, we might scale back a little bit, but we will continue to put these videos out. Um, but yes, if, if you become a member, you really help us uh, put out more and more programs like this. So thank you to all of you who have. Um, and thanks yet again for tuning in. And thank you, Amy, for being with us today. Oh, thanks for having me. It was fun. And uh, with that, this is uh, John and Amy signing off. We'll see you next time.